So today I'm pleased to be joined by my first returning guest on the podcast, Mr. Dan Madigan. Dan, how are you doing since? Good, good. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Yeah. How are you? you guys good over there? Oh, good. As good as can be. Everything is still closed, but we're patiently waiting for, say, society to reopen. Maybe it shouldn't reopen. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the societies I know. Maybe we're better off starting from scratch. It's going to be a while anyway. Mm. So following on from the last podcast, which you can check out on the channel, uh, we wanted to dig deep into a few storylines that you may or may not have been involved in that you might want to talk about. Yes, may or may not, not yes. the word. In there. Okay. Because there's a lot written, written on the internet that we want to try to get to the bottom of. Yeah, but before we, go in, before we has, go into what... Has to be true on the internet. Yeah. If it's written on the internet, it's definitely true. Absolutely. Before we get into one of the more controversial storylines, I just want to talk to you a minute about Kane, uh, Glenn Jacobs, and what he's like to work with, both like in the wrestling world and in terms of the movie. I thought, um, personally, even before I met Glenn, you know, I was a fan of the character. Um, it's such, it was such a unique character, and it, and it worked in that wrestling world, that surreal world, that kind of horrific world that him being aligned with the Undertaker make perfect sense. Um, so I I watched him and I, I, I admired that character. And then when the nod comes, hey, the WWE wants to make a movie, we want to use Kane as a star vehicle. Okay, so that works well. I'm, you know, I'm a screenwriter when they pay me. Um, but every guy has a horror story in them and stuff. And you know, this and now I see this Glenn Jacobs is like this big six foot eight canvas to create your story on. So knowing I was going to work with Kane, at least write something for him, that was advantageous to me because I knew where I was going to go, or at least what the fans knew of this character. And so I wrote, I wrote the script, the treatment of the script, and they gave it to Glenn, and he read it. And then when I finally get to meet him, was, you, know, you see the guy on TV as this hulking, sweaty, monstrous fiend, and he's a well-spoken, intelligent, highly well-read guy. And we hit it off very well. So was, I'm a fan of history. He's a fan of history. He's a big, big into politics and stuff. And so we had a lot of conversations outside of wrestling. And he read the script of uh, Cena Weevil. Um, he didn't really, he had some questions. We talked about this and that, how you would do certain things. But I said, you know, uh, this is an extension of your character. It's like writing for wrestling at one point. And when you write for a wrestler, an established wrestler, you're not going to tell them what to do. You're going to maybe, hey, guide him and stuff. But you're not going to tell him, hey, this is what you should do because the character has to be somewhat natural to him. So I knew that Kane character. So I was gearing my story towards someone like that. Some of the fans would see, you know, the fans understand, you know, he's not going to be a love interest. Uh, sorry, Glenn's not going to be a love interest. He's not going to be like you know, romantically. He's not going to be a swashbuckler. So you, you worked his strengths. And so that worked. And then just a fun guy to be around, very smart, um, hard worker. And we would talk, you know, we would talk backstage about politics or something. And uh, we'd get deep into conversation. All of a sudden, uh, Glenn, it's time to, it's, your match is coming up. He'd go to the match. 20 minutes later, he comes back, sweaty and bleeding, picks up the conversation again where we left off. You know, so it was, it was fun to work with him and talk with him. And I learned a lot from him. Um, He's very well read, but he's very well prepared too. He's, he's well prepared in the ring. He was well prepared on screen, uh, on set. Uh, he got along very well with the director, which is a big plus. You know, he got along with Gregory Dark, and he understood the material. So all in all, working with Glenn was just uh, to me. And and then I get to work with his character as Kane later on. I kept working with his character, so I had a, a working relationship with him and a personal relationship. And so that worked out for both of us. I knew what he liked. I knew what he, he liked. Uh, we worked well together. I knew his strengths and weaknesses, we'll say. And it worked from there. Yeah, you could, like, I used to, this is going back a long time now, maybe 20 years ago. I used to get Power Slam magazine is what it was called. And it was like a magazine, say, the internet was only just becoming big in Ireland and it was still dial up and it was really slow and things like that. So magazines were still popular and I'd read these magazines and they'd be talking about Kane and they'd be talking about politics and things like that. And it's just something that you never associated that character with at the time, because at the time he was still wearing the mask. There was still in a 
bit of an enigma around him as well. Yeah, yeah. He's the mayor. Of, he's the mayor of a town in Tennessee. I mean, so he, he takes politics. He doesn't. Stay, I mean, he he walks the walk and talks the talk. He knows what he's talking about. He's a libertarian. He's well versed in the history of libertarianism. Um, he knows about economic plans, about the, um, the financial structures. I mean, really talking to the guy backstage is like you know, it, it's it's eye opening. If if you want to take the time and learn something, Glenn really is a very well educated, well rounded guy. And so, like I said, I'm a history buff myself, so I learned a lot just talking to him, book recommendations and whatnot. And um, it's funny, you know, when you see someone and you know someone, it's two different things. Yeah, I, did you see him at the Rumble? He came back to the Rumble there on Sunday as well. He looked like he still looked like a beast. Oh yeah, I, I, I so which you get, a, I got a pop for that. You know, he's always in shape. He's a big guy. He's always been in shape. Uh, it takes care. I mean, I've had dinner with him many times. You know, I mean, he's very cautious when he eats chicken and broccoli. I mean, that, and that was out at a restaurant. So you know, he's. I'm not surprised he came. I'm glad, glad he got a big pop and stuff. And the Rumble's one of the ones you always no matter what you sort of check into, you know? Yeah. It's just a shame still there was no crowd there, but I think the Thunderdome with the countdown and everything, whilst I'm not a big fan of it, it kind of worked okay for the rumble, I thought. Yeah. I mean, the crowd, you realize now at this point, not just wrestling, but every sport, how important fact of the crowd is, you know, the crowd Mm -hmm. mentioned that before the the wrestlers and the athletes feed off that energy. They hear. I mean, it's sort of it, 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 it. It's it's like that home field advantage, you know, yeah. that you need yeah. sometimes. You go up there, you, you wrestle, you perform in front of the crowd, and while having that, you know, it, it, it's a whole dynamic that's gone. And you also see you're seeing things you didn't notice before, which isn't always a good thing. Just before you came into the WWE, anyway, the Katie Vick storyline happened. And I've seen in a, a lot of websites online, your name is kind of associated with it, even though you weren't there at the time. Yeah. What do you What do you know about that? Or what have you heard from going into work after that? Well, I I remember when I was uh, they were bringing me on. The producers was the producers, the producers of the film. Let me excuse me, um, the guys that were running Vince's production company. Um, yeah. They're the ones that were bringing me in to meet the, the writing team, Stephanie and whatnot. And they said, you know, why don't you watch the show and just keep, you know, see what we're going, what we're going for, right? So I sat down, I started watching Raw and SmackDown. I, of course, I'd watched it before, but now I'm watching it, not as a fan, but, you know, as a writer, I'm watching how the story's progressing. And I sit down that one, I remember watching the famous Katie Vick angle. And there comes Triple H, who's dressed as Kane, and he's in a, he's in a funeral home. And there is a body, you know, supposedly Kane's demise girlfriend, Katie Vick. And then Triple H proceeds to climb into the coffin, having necrophilic um, romantic, you know, intercourse with this character. And at one point, at one point, and I can't believe I'm saying this, by the way, it's just even the words coming in my mouth. Like he pulls out, you know, a brains or something, remember? And he says, yeah. I, I, I screwed your brains out. And I watched that. I'm home watching this thinking, because they want me to watch the show, I'm thinking, well, I guess with the exception of child porn snuff films, I could write anything for these people. Because they literally, the bar wasn't just lowered, it was buried deep into the ground, into the core of the earth. You'd never find, I mean, the bar was shoved down so low. And I was amazed. I go, did anyone think this is a good idea? I'm I'm no prude. Listen, I love a good necrophilia story, but at least do it (laughs) I mean, do it good, do it so like at least it, you know, like I would have, I guess I would have stolen the body. I would have, you know, you know, had it for a three week thing. I would have hinted at certain things, you know, implied things. Read Edgar Allan Poe's poem, Annabelle Lee. He implies things. I mean, necrophilia has been around. Achilles in the Trojan War was accused of it, right? So it's always been a myth in mythology and literature, but it done in such a way that okay, it, you know, you hinted things. You hinted all the taboos, incest, cannibalism. You can hint at things. Well, you just come out and do that, you're like, there's no place to go. They went straight in on it, really. Yeah, it's like, there's no place to go. I'm thinking, did anyone, did anyone proofread this? Did anyone say this is a bad idea? But they don't. They, they didn't at the time. And I was there afterwards, thinking, geez, this is, this is. You, you want to get a PG rating, and this is what you're doing? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, what family are you looking to get? The Manson family? Who the fuck is watching this with this type of stuff? You know. It, it, it didn't. It didn't make it to air over here. You won't be surprised oh, to know. 
luck, you know, lucky. You're lucky. And what drove me crazy is, um, and I said it, I said when I was there, I go, you know, I, at first I kept my mouth shut. I wasn't stupid. But then I get to voice my opinion. So, you know, when you do an angle like that, it's a shock value. And, okay, it's shocking. And then shock dissipates. It goes away. And it's like when you're writing a horror story or reading a book, you, you get shocked and then it goes away. But when you build suspense, suspense builds and it goes with you. And, and you can feel either terror or dread, but it, it has a prolonged effect where shock can wear out very quickly. And something like that was a very shocking incident, but it didn't, didn't go anywhere. It's, it had, it's had so much publicity, so much infamy since then, but yet it was a one-off thing that didn't really go anywhere. I mean, I would have taken the body and you know, had it hidden and then implied at it. And all of a sudden, Katie Vick comes back from the dead and she's carrying the baby. Now you got some necrophilic babies, you know, whatever. It, you know, <laughs> I shouldn't even said, even now that's going to come back to bite me in the ass, right? But still, you know, prolong it. Do something with it that's not just the same stuff you see like that, you know? I grew up watching exploitative films and grindhouse films. That's that's my boathouse, whatever it is. But at least the stuff I like to see is at least done in a, such a way that I know it's sleazy, but I'm not watching what my eight-year-old kid on a couch on Monday night, you know? But that's that was the decision. And what happened was after I left the WWE, I've been it was interviewed a couple times in podcasts, and I came up publicly. I said I think that that was a, a bad angle. It wasn't I mean because it didn't go anywhere. It was bad. It just didn't it wasn't well put together. And I think someone who was writing about me saw my name. They saw the Katie Vick angle. And they put it together without realizing. I said this is a bad angle, you know. And they just said oh, all of a sudden Dan Madigan created the Katie Vick. I wasn't even working for the company then. I wasn't even there. And some people have attributed that to me. And listen, I can ruin my own career myself. I've done it perfectly. I don't need any outside help ruining my career. So, but I want to say now, I had nothing to do with that angle. Um, And if I was going to do a necrophilia angle, it would have been better. Let's just say that. (laughs) Even that's going to get me in trouble. But still, you know, just think think of when you do something, think coming out of it, we're going to go with it. And they went no place with it. Do you think it was um, Triple H and Vince, like, obviously said, yeah, we're going right. to run with this? Like, it had to have been. Triple H was in it himself, so he had to have given it the green light. It literally is. I mean, it's it's their show. Uh, something like that, you know, if Vince found it distasteful, he wouldn't have done it. It just would if, if Vince didn't want to do it, he's not going to do it. That's it. There's no twisting his arm. There's no – and I had many conversations – heated debates, arguments about certain angles and whatnot. And sometimes he would change his mind. He would explain. So other times he would say no. Other times it's like, no. And he want, he wanted that angle. And it's, I could it's, saying that, you know, and I could, I could see the machinations in his brain. Oh, this would be interesting. I'm like, he did a whole bit. Remember where they were operating in JR's butt and they're pulling stuff out of his ass. I go, I mean, so, so <laughs> necrophilia is a big leap. I mean, <laughs> It's insane. Um, yeah, like it, he he was definitely involved in that, like a hundred percent. Like he definitely gave. It's like what you said the last time on the podcast. It was like uh, when we were referencing the the penis. I don't want to bring it up again. If anyone wants to yeah. listen to that, they can talk about it. But you said nobody said to him it was a bad idea. No, yeah, no one, no one. See it. I. That's why I guess one of the, one of the many reasons I got fired. I go bad idea. Three foot attacking penis. Bad idea in this scenario, at least. You know, maybe if you have another story for a three foot penis attacking people, I'm all in on. Trust me, I'd love it. But it didn't work yet. And when he wants something, it's his company. Yeah. He signs. He signs my check. I don't sign his check. So at the end of the day, he's my boss. And you fight to a point, and you really. He told me once. He said. He said. Interesting. Goes. Pick the hill to die on, Dan. And I said, you know what, the three foot penis hill. That's the hill I was going to die on. That's the one. I, that was that was my pork chop hill. That was my Alamo. That was it. That was my midway. I'm going to fight the three foot penis fight. And after that, it was downhill. A, a character that you were there for actually that I didn't know that you were involved at the time was uh, the Muhammad Hassan character. Yes. Which is, yes. you know, which is still talked about to this day. Like, yeah. what are your memories of of that angle and the way it worked out and the reception kind of behind it? From stateside point of view, yet again, didn't make TV over here really. That's a lot of stuff cut out. 
Yeah, I, I, I found out later on a lot of stuff had been edited um, in Ireland and in England, which is kind of disturbing because it disrupts the storylines. Um, I'm, I'm the biggest proponent against censorship. Um, I met it was Mark and Mark, Sean, yeah, Clark, yeah. and they were they came up I think with OBW, but we had them backstage, and I was working with them, and they both had this great look. And Davari could speak Farsi and stuff, and we just started working. I started doing promos with them and stuff, and we started talk, doing these great promos about um, you know, you're always picking on my great uncle Hassan. And you're all meaning you know, Saddam Hussein. We're always implying things like this is related to the family. And we had really, we had them as, as really rich, obnoxious Middle Easterners. Everyone, they're the stereotype. But then we had underlying things. You hate us because we're different. You hate us because we're not you. And I said, make the promos more in depth and stuff, not just like, you know, why do we hate them? What's going And defend yourself from this stuff. So we had a lot of fun doing that. And then I had, I was lucky to have Dr. Runjan Chiver. On the team, he was a he's a, a, a doctor, a professor now in cinematic studies, and he's he's Hindu, so he was more open and more uh, sensitive to a lot of racial issues. So Ranjit was big helpful in that, creating these characters. We did these great he, we did these great vignettes and stuff with these guys. And I said this this is a great heat because it had only been three years since 9/11, three or four years. So there's still that hot sentiment going around, and these guys were just great characters to work with. I mean. Um, Hussan had a, a program with Undertaker. I mean, that's a career-defining moment um, coming out of something like that. You could make a career out of that. And I thought it was, I thought these guys had a lot of potential. Davari still has got amazing potential. Uh, but I thought there was, there was something really big. It's, it's natural heat. You didn't have to create it. You know, it was already there. It was in, it was in the, the zeitgeist, I hate that word. But, you know, there was that anti-Middle Eastern feel. And you get two guys here that represent something that – a, you hate them, but then they turn it on you. Why do you hate us? You know, and, and it makes the characters more in depth. It makes them a, a richer character. I just wish that they had had extended that that life, that character. The Mark Capani, I believe, is a school teacher now, which is a complete change of direction altogether. Yeah, I thought he was fantastic. He was he was he had the look. He, he had the he it is fant- he was great on the he. The mic, he, great mic skills. Sean was a fantastic mouthpiece, and he's got great wrestling skills, you know. And um, yeah. I, I thought that this really could have been a, a frac, fraction that could have gone, you know, uh, longer. And and think about it because you've got the pulse on the cultural things that's happening, the current events, and you really could have played. We still have problems with the Middle East now. You could have played those characters, could have turned back and forth, back and forth. They could have lined with other people and stuff. Like this. They could have, you could have brought in an, a, a great Russian character at the time, you know? You know, you could have really made this sort of uh, faction of characters that didn't really, it just didn't go anywhere. It was just sad. It was just sad. But, you know, he had his time, which is more than most people get. Yeah, it was kind of like, it, it was leading up to that match with The Undertaker. But then the what you had recorded, I remember, coincided with the London bombings and then kind of shit hit the fan. Even though you recorded that on, say, Tuesday but it was aired on Thursday. Yeah. Yet again, it was meant to be aired in the UK and aired on Friday. It didn't make it to TV. But that's when, like, what was the reaction from Vince, like, after that happened? Oh, well, I remember I was working with Teddy Long, and um, and I always loved to work with Teddy, and I was writing these promos. I, mean, I forget what the exact promo was, but the line was, he didn't want to get fired. And he says, well, I'm not going to put my head in that chopping block. And that's just after there was a beheading. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I totally I, I wasn't thinking about that. I'm thinking about this. Just someone would say, but I don't want to put my head in the chopping block about being fired. And Vince read that. And he goes, no, no, no. You know, now if this incident didn't happen, there wouldn't have been a problem. But actually, he caught it, which is surprising. I'm surprised he caught it. But we got to cut that out. So we're very sensitive about certain things like that. You know, um, people, you know, we had these guys jumping over the, you know, they were jumping over the um, banister and stuff. These masked uh, assailants. And then two days later, it actually happens. So yeah. it's, it's life imitating art, vice versa. So you got to be very, you got to be sensitive to stuff like that. You know, I mean, we push the envelope, but you don't want to jam it in their face. I think it was uh, was it UPN at the time that were doing SmackDown, and they were like, no, nope, can't have this anymore. So they took them off. He, they took Muhammad Hassan off TV, yeah. but then had he had one last match that wasn't promoted at the Great American Bash, and then the Undertaker. Uh, done the last ride to him through the stage and he was never seen again 
which really I find that distasteful in a lot of ways. Um, a, you, you have this entity dictating what you're going to do creatively, and then you're screwing a guy's career, a guy's livelihood. He's, we've now established this guy as Hussan, and he's, he's given heart and soul to it. And all of a sudden, you know, he has to suffer. You know, uh, creatively, we're going to pay the consequences. What about freedom of choice? I mean, we could have cre- you could have worked on the angles somehow where, you know what, let's see why we hate the guy. Let, let, let's see his point of view. Why am I, you know, let's go through his journey, you know, and, and, and instead of just dropping something like that. They should have really taken the time. We've invested the time. The guy's in shape. He could work. He could do a program. Now, think about it. You give the guy three, four weeks off. He comes back with another angle, the same character, but a different angle. You're already invested where this guy's going to go and stuff. Is this guy going to he's, – he's going to change our viewpoint about certain people and stuff. But, you know, sometimes they just cut and that's it. And it's just sad. It's, it was a sad uh, affair all around. Yeah, because he was a good athlete. They could have even not stuck with the character or maybe taken him off TV for a while and just rebranded him like to do with people either. They could have – he could have had an epiphany. He could have he could have been he could have gone on the road to Damascus. He could have you know and, and become Christianized. You know whatever it is. You could have you could have gone down any road like that. You could have he, he is a good, he's Italian for God's sake. So you could have made him anything. You know you mm-hmm. could have just to get rid of a guy's credit. Maybe too it could be his his choice too. I don't know. Maybe yeah, he, he probably had enough. Who knows? He had enough. I didn't really get to speak to him afterwards as much. It was probably a lot for him to take as a person, like because he was front and center of it. You know as well. Yeah. You're in the eye of the storm. You are the eye of the storm. When you're a heel with that much heat, uh, and I remember saying this to people. I remember saying this to Toledo once, and she was really, this was she was doing heel stuff. She was, the crowds hate me. I go, well, that's, that, you're doing your job. You're doing your job. When they hate you and they despise you, you are doing what you're supposed to do. Because it's the bad guy, it's the heel, the rudo, and all the stories, and all the mythology, and all the narrative, they dictate the story. They're the ones that get the story going. A hero is just the guy waiting to do something. He's reactionary. But the bad guy, he's the alpha dog. So when people want to see you down, they want to get rid of you, when they hate you, you're building emotion that's, that drives them forward. That's your job. The bad guy always dictates the story. And you, I, that you should revel in that. Yeah. Do you have much memories? I see a lot written online about you and... When you ultimately left WWE, and it was to do around the Heidenreich angle. What what exactly is the the true story behind that? All right, true story, true story. Like I said earlier, I, I bullshit, but I don't lie, so I'll give you the complete true story. Yeah. Prior to the Heidenreich angle, we had, uh, Kenzo Suzuki came into the company, and uh, he was with his wife Hiroko. Great athlete, big in Japan, you know. Some I follow Japanese wrestling, and um, tall, big guy. But once again, okay, he's Japanese. What are we going to do with him? He can't really speak English. Uh, they had a mouthpiece at the time, and I'm thinking, okay, we've done we've done the uh, samurai ninja thing. We've done these different angles, right? Which is kind of like you kind of pigeonhole yourself in certain angles. And he's a great character. What are you going to do with this guy? And I and I for some reason I said. We were at the table. Those both writing teams were there, Raw and SmackDown. And I said, Vince, hold on, picture this, picture this, right? You are watching the screen. All of a sudden, you see an atomic explosion, a mushroom cloud erupts on the screen, and two Asian eyes come out, and you see underneath Hirohito is coming. And I start acting this thing out, and I said, and I started cutting a promo like, out of the rubble comes a great bronze warrior. All the bullshit, right? You know, trying to. Yeah. Aff- defend his people's honor, look back, you know, his, his integrity of the country. And I said, we'll make him the emperor's grandson. And I started getting into it, pitching all these ideas, and Vince loved it. And he actually bought archival footage. Of, uh, he actually got footage of uh, the day after Hiroshima was bombed. We cut this promo. We, we did a whole, a whole B-roll thing, the whole thing. You can see it online. And it re- really was kind of crazy. And you see the mushroom cloud, you see the explosion. There's someone ha- someone got a bucket of blood, threw it on the screen, and out of the blood says, Hirohito is coming, right? So we're going to bring the Emperor's grandson to, to SmackDown. He's going to, you know, re- you know, recharge his nation's honor. He's going to come from the rubble. 
Vince loved that. I was in the office when he they should. He was like happy as hell. He was all happy, and I was like, oh, I'm in. Finally, I'm in the good graces with Vince. This is fantastic. This is great. God damn it, I love it. Well, the next day, Vince comes into the office, and he puts the suitcase down, and he goes, "We don't talk about Hirohito. We don't mention Hirohito. It never happened." So I'm so I'm like, like twelve hours ago, I was the golden boy. <laughs> now like, hey, so. But just shits and giggles. What happened? He goes, well, apparently the Japanese royal family watches wrestling, and they're pissed off at us, and they're going to sue us, and they're going to kick out boys out of Japan, and we're in a lot of trouble. And I said, Vince, in all honesty, I said, I didn't know there still was a Japanese royal family. And he goes, neither did I, but they watch wrestling, and they're going to fuck us, right? So <laughs> it's like, boom. This character was like, done. And you would mention it was done, right? Uh, so I said, okay, so that, that so that's Hirohito. And weeks later, I'm still licking my wounds. I'm trying to get back, you know, out of the doghouse. And sometime later, we're spitballing stuff. It was both teams again. And I had seen John Heidenreich. Um, I knew who he was. Big, big guy. You know, Jack, like six seven. He looks like Rutger Howard jacked up. Big lantern jaw. He looks like if you're going to create an SS Stormtrooper, from scratch, this is the guy. Yeah. I want this guy, right? And and I said, Vince, picture this, right? And Ed Kosky, one of the writers, a friend of mine, he I, he his body physically started to sh- like shrink because he think he knew what I was going to do. I go, Vince, it's 1945, and I was just going, oh no, not again. I go, it's the end of the war, right? I go, we're the we're the French Alps, and in the hidden cave. A group of giants, a German scientists, I created the ultimate Nazi stormtrooper. They created the ultimate warrior, the, the uber, uber Nazi, Baron von Bava. And I started walking around the room thinking that if I really punched at home, he'd love it. And I started singing, like everyone does, Duschland Uberalist, really trying to, you know, I said, picture this, him dancing, he's coming to the ring with a goose step, he's goose stepping to the ring. And we'll get Paul Heyman to be his manager. Even though he's Jewish, Paul, this is, it was just like, and all back and forth. And I'm, I'm playing like a fucking madman. I'm like, and I could see it now I'm thinking, this is going to be great. Baron Von Bava, he's, he's goose stepping to the ring, and Paul's there, and he's going to destroy everybody. It's the fourth fucking Reich. You could hear an atom split in the room. I mean, there was dead silence. And everyone just stared at me like I was a mental case. And Vince. He, Vince didn't say where he just looked at his suitcase. He got up, got his suitcase. He walked to the door, turned around and looked at me, and walked out. Didn't say a word. And then Ed goes, well, that's the first in company history. It's like, <laughs> but ironically, 20 minutes later, that gets leaked to the dirt sheets. Someone in the room was leaking shit to the dirt sheets. So there's so, a rat. There was a rat. There was a rat in the room, a, a real rat. And all of a sudden, we see Frozen Nazi, or Nazical, you know, like an icicle, Nazical, damn out of this. And, and I ran to John Heidenreich like a week later. We were doing, I forget where we were. Mm-hmm. And you see him, this hulking blonde. I, I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is my, I'm in, this is my Baron von Bava. And I go, so I go, his name's Heidenreich, for God's sakes. I said, tell me you speak German. And he looks at me with that big smile and a big southern list. Not a lick, brother. I can't speak a lick. God damn it. You know, it's oh, so close, you know, but I said to Vince, like a word wrestling, we have the ultimate personification of good guy versus bad guy, heel versus baby. This is what we do. I go, the ultimate bad guy literally in in society now in the last 80 years is the Nazi. I mean, it's the bad guy. He yeah. represents everything that's wrong in society. We have this guy. He is going to be vanquished and we're going to show why he's wrong. Right. I go, what's wrong? We can't insult Nazis now. Are we that correct that you, know, you can't insult the, the, the Third Reich? And so I, I just think I, I, the whole thing maybe was a little, maybe over, stood my, over a bit too much. But um, the, the, the Kenzo Suzuki stuff hurt me. You know, I had the Japanese. I was doing all the axes. I was going to probably do Mussolini's granddaughter next. Who knows what's going to happen? Right. But I figured if you're going to play with bad guys, get the ultimate bad guy. Get the ultimate bad guys, you know, and um, that didn't work out. But that that sort of followed me. That that that's between the the frozen Nazi and the three foot penis. These things followed me. I 
my entire career. I'm dodging Nazis. I'm goose stepping Nazis and penises right and left. It's crazy. Oh, hopefully by the end of these few uh, podcasts that we do, we can get that uh, penis off your back and that Nazi yeah. off your back. Exactly. I want I want a colonic or an exorcism, but I want them gone. <laughs> and like uh, in terms of the Heidenreich story, then you said like that somebody had leaked that to would say the the dirt sheets or the media, but that's that's a long time ago. Like it wasn't as big then as it was now. So you probably have in your in your own head like who that was. There couldn't have been too many people at that I, I meeting. Know I know who yeah. it was. I'm not asking you for names or anything like that. Exactly but how many people would have been at that meeting? Maybe ten? No, there was no there was literally there was uh less than eight people. Okay. It was, it was, you know, you had, you had Pritchard, Hayes, me, Klasky, uh, Brian Gortz, this other person. There was, you know, so it was only the core people. And we found out later on someone had been leaking some and that's the biggest slap in the face. I mean, we're creating both teams are creating uh, content for the fans, for the wrestlers, for the business. And we're busting our ass. I mean, we're really we have no days off in that show. We work every Monday, no holidays. We're constantly working. And you want to create something for the fans, for the business. And then someone in your own team starts leaking shit out. That's the ultimate stab in the back. And I, I and it, it came to light afterwards. But it was just I thought that was um, one of the worst things you could do to the business. Obviously, there was probably money involved then, yeah, I, you would you know, think. I don't know. I don't know about that. I, I always mm-hmm. thought it was just a way to say, hey, I'm so in, I can give you all this information. Maybe or, ego plays a part, yeah? Or I'd be the exact opposite. You know, it's, it's a need-to-know basis, and you don't need to know. You need to know when it's aired. You want to be surprised. When you, when you create something as a writer or as an artist, you put a lot of time and effort into it, and you want the, the final part to get out there. And you don't want things, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. You want to see the final product when you're ready for it. But to sit there and to leak shit out like that, to the dirt sheets of all things, it's like the paparazzi. It's like, really? you got to really, this is what you resort to? It, when you can't trust your team, then there's a problem. It's it's like that over here. We have, um, there's a, a company over here called Paddy Power. They're a betting company. So they take bets on the big wrestling events. And usually an hour before they start, the odds shorten, so you kind of know who's going to win the matches. Yeah. Even over here, like, it's crazy that still happens. Yeah, it's, you know, I would think that um, there should be some professionalism, but some pride in the work and stuff. I go, we all, at this, at this point now, if I told people the wrestling's at work, I'm not surprising anybody. It's like, you're not going to, you know, if the, the kayfabe is gone, you're not going to surprise. But, but it's like the idea, it's like leaking a script of a movie script or certain scenes, you know, you want to surprise the fans. You're doing this for the fans, basically. You want to give them something new. So all of a sudden, it's like watching a movie trailer where they put all the great scenes in it. Why, why watch the movie? Now I've seen everything. Why tip your hand? Um, I think we're in a society where we want, we want instant gratification. We want to see everything. Well, I, I don't watch previews to movies. I don't read reviews. I want to see the film for myself. I want to watch the match for myself. I want to enjoy things that I've never seen or I don't know are coming. Um, but a lot of people have this urge to be the first one to give the, I'm giving the news first. I'm breaking the story. Who cares? You know, it's going to break eventually. The world would be a better place without spoilers and maybe even the internet in general. <laughs> well, that's, that, that's a killer of, uh, that's a killer of thing. I mean, it's funny because you have, I'll go down the rabbit hole. I mean, I'll, I'll go on YouTube and I'll be there for, instead of writing, I'll be watching Italian zombie movies. I'll be watching Japanese Yakuza films. I'll be watching everything I'm supposed to watch. Forget wrestling matches, right? But um, you have everything at your fingertips. You can read the classics. You can study literature. You can study science. You can study anything. And yet people will waste their time with TikTok and shit like this. People with cat videos and, and just nothing. And I think the problem is when there's, when there's too much time, we don't get enough done. I know for myself as a writer, when I have too much time, I'm all over the place. But when I my time's limited, okay, I've got to get this done, I've got to get that done, and it works for me. When I was doing Raw and SmackDown, I had to get the SmackDown stuff done. I got stuff for me, even though I wasn't directly on Raw, I was actually working on Raw. So you have to get your stuff down. So time limits, I think, as a writer, an artist, it, it helps you. Uh, when you get too much time, you don't do enough. Well, it was great to get to the the back of some of those kind of stories. Um, you're going to be joining us again anyway soon to talk about writing and 
Mexican wrestling and your projects there and what the future holds. And we look forward to that. Yeah, I um, I look forward to being back on the show. Um, good luck, brother. Be careful over there. Uh, the Mexican wrestling, that's a whole different chapter of my life. And um, we'd love to talk about that if people want to hear it. But thanks for having me on again. Enjoy. Yeah, it was a pleasure. A pleasure again. Thank you, Dan. Be safe. I'll talk to you soon. If you enjoy the content on our channel, we'd appreciate a subscription. Thank you. Thank you.